So Star Trek may have simped for Elon Musk in its past couple iterations, but then I saw this around on Twitter the other day from Fox News. Opinion, Star Trek writers take Starship Enterprise where it's never gone before. Woke politics. Now, I'm someone who really does not have much of a history with the Star Trek franchise. My dad is really, really into it. So I've watched a couple episodes of like Picard when he's been watching that. And I'm familiar enough with some of the old ones just based on watching like a couple episodes here and there. But because of like the broader cultural impact, I of course know that Star Trek is pretty well known for at the very least progressive politics helped by the fact it does exist in this more like utopic view of humanity which is in a post scarcity world it's like literally the complete opposite of something like cowboy bebop and other dystopian sci-fi franchises it's very much about like i guess humanity reaching its potential in a lot of ways but the belief star trek has suddenly gone woke in 2022 is just like absolutely ridiculous but this isn't like one guy writing a fox news column if you look at anti sjw nerd channels they constantly talk about star trek going woke so what this video is essentially going to be is me just i guess talking about star trek talking about i guess the more like socialist influences and the progressive liberal influences on basically each iteration of Star Trek, apart from maybe some of the newer ones. And then I just want to link it broadly to how more right-wing types just do not understand political messages in science fiction because the science fiction is often used to make political points about our contemporary society. But for a lot of conservatives, because of the way they don't have critical thinking, they literally believe because the science fiction is set in like the future or like another planet or is about aliens, it couldn't possibly have a message about real world politics, whether that is, you know, Avatar's recently in the news has a left wing message, whether that is Star Wars and whether that is Blade Runner and something everyone loves at the moment, including loads of right wing nerd channels and people like Ben Shapiro, something like dune the recent sci-fi movie which director said is like a critique of capitalism of course it's a very big critique of settler colonialism and is inspired by islamic and arab uprisings against things like british colonialism sounds pretty woke to me but a lot of right-wingers who say that woke is ruining everything don't actually think any of these things i've just mentioned are woke so i guess we also have to establish like what woke even means in the context of these things so all of that coming up in the video today but before we go any further i'm just going to remind you please like the video and i guess for the comments let me know what is the worst misinterpretation of like more progressive sci-fi like who have you seen has taken the complete wrong message from a pretty obvious like political commentary also for every 5k we get a new chocolate orange we're actually getting really close to 75k i think we've got about 200 and something subs to go please help me get another chocolate orange for this pyramid i know a lot of people in the comments are getting mad about how i've organized it by color i promise if we get one more I will actually do a better job at organizing these oranges. Also, follow me on social media at The Cavernacle on Twitter, on Instagram. Join our subreddit down in the description. Subscribe to my second channel where I archive all my live streams, which I usually do twice a week. The second channel is called The Cavernacle Extra. Also, consider supporting me on Patreon. I want to build up as many $1 to $3 patrons as possible, and the benefits of that are getting my Nintendo Switch friend code and getting access to the private patrons Discord server. Also, since we're talking about sci-fi, this is also the day Vangelis has passed the way, and I recommend for anyone, if you have never watched Blade Runner, go watch Blade Runner just for the soundtrack. And if I had to recommend two tracks to you from him that maybe you haven't heard before, because it's not in like his mainstream films. Uh, there's one song called Le Sing Bleu, which is from, I think, a documentary. And there's another one called Rev. These both sound like they could have been taken from Blade Runner. So rest in peace, obviously. He was an absolutely massive influence on synth music as a whole, which I love. I tweeted about this today if you want to read more about my thoughts on his passing. But yeah, massive, massive loss. Please respect him by listening to some Blade Runner today. So we're going to start this video by going through this Fox News article, talking about how Star Trek is basically being ruined by 
woke politics. And then I want to talk a bit about Stacey Abrams appearing as the president of Earth and the right wing backlash to that. So the Fox News article about Star Trek going woke is written by a guy called David Marcus, who is a columnist living in New York and the author of Charade, The COVID Lies That Crashed the Nation, seems pretty stable, has wrote such articles as Woke Disney versus Walt Disney, Is Political Corporate Model Sustainable or Just Goofy? And Donald Trump Broke the Woke Stranglehold on Our Country and on Us. So this article says, there is no more quintessential American story universe than Star Trek. Since its creation in 1966, the franchise has had myriad iterations on big screen and small basically invented the sci-fi convention and has charmed audiences across every generation. But in two recent episodes, writers crossed a line where no Star Trek has gone before. That is to say, they got directly involved in partisan politics. They've never ever done this before. The first blatant example of electioneering on Star Trek Discovery was a cameo by current and former Georgia gubernatorial candidate Stacey Abrams, none other than the president of the Federation of Planets. Now, this is actually wrong, so I don't know if this guy even watched it. She's actually the president of Earth who's trying to join the Federation. The second was a weird plot twist in the pilot of a new show, Strange New Worlds, in which the 2020 Capitol riot is depicted and blamed for starting a second American Civil War and the destruction of the planet. To put it more succinctly, Orange Man Bad. And again, the riot was not in 2020, it was in 2021. Like, does this guy have no editors on this article making two massive mistakes in like the first paragraph? To be fair, since the original 1960s series, Star Trek has always delved into cultural and societal issues. It has always been credited with diverse casts, with tackling issues like saving the whales, and with reflecting on American and global foreign policy. Okay, that sounds pretty woke to me, I guess. All of that should live long and prosper, but the two recent incidences go a good deal further. This isn't issue advocacy, it is pure partisan politics. This is part of a broader galaxy of problems, as we saw recently with Disney, which owns Star Wars, going to battle with Florida Governor Rod DeSantis. Again, who is checking this guy's writing? Why does it say Rod DeSantis? This is the third mistake I've read in like the first bit of the article. The central confusion here is the difference between showing broad support for things like basic civil rights and openly advocating for one political party's answers for securing them. So for example, almost everyone supports voting rights, but that isn't the same as supporting Stacey Abrams. Almost everyone condemns the riot and political violence. No, they definitely don't. But that's not the same as placing unique blame on one single event from one side of the spectrum. Ultimately, the problem here is that this kind of political signaling is alienating for those fans who are not part of the Democratic Party political tribe. But as a fan myself, it hasn't made me turn off the shows, but it's jarring and also breaks the narrative spell of the fantasy and science fiction, which is why people tune in in the first place. So like, I massively disagree with people needing science fiction as an escape from reality when a lot of the time it's pretty much like tackling contemporary issues. But if you can move past it, you culture war conservative warrior, I'm sure a lot of people who are not Democrats and don't like the Democrats, I am someone who doesn't like the Democrats, and I'm not someone who buys into this like cult of personality about Stacey Abrams. I could definitely move past that as well, even though I think the Stacey Abrams thing is pretty cringe anyway. The irony is that all three new Star Trek live action shows are quite progressive in the diversity of their casting, and despite hysterical concerns about a backlash that never actually happens, everyone is on board as long as the story and acting are good. Artists can always have and should use their work to hold a mirror up, to their culture and society, even to advocate for broad agenda items. What they shouldn't do is beam the equivalent of a 30 second Democratic Party political ad into the middle of a space venture. So when you're someone who has seen a lot of arguments against woke politics in like nerd media, I think this whole article shows that the word woke is so meaningless, right? So this guy in the article is someone who says the diverse casting is not a bad thing. This is a guy using the term woke politics, but to a lot of people, you guys will know, I've covered them a lot, anti-SJW nerd channels, the diverse casting is the woke politics. Like, that pretty much is the be-all and end-all of woke politics, is having a black woman or, you know, an Asian man or a transgender character or a non-binary character in your show. That is the woke politics. But this guy is saying that stuff is fine. His problem is a commentary on contemporary US politics. Now, with the Stacey Abrams thing, I just think it's stupid. I don't believe in worshipping political figures. Like, I'm someone who likes AOC and like the squad like a fair bit, 
But at the same time, I've criticised them loads because they're politicians. They make decisions based on political factors like getting back into office. I'm not going to hold them up as some sort of hero. The same happened when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. Loads of people were having that like notorious um, RBG art, never mentioning any of the bad things she believed in, basically made her out to be a saint. And that is a problem with like Blue Maga and these democratic fanatics. I don't think showing things from the Capitol riots and showing Earth like descending into partisanship is a bad thing. Like you're saying in your article, you think it's a bad thing. So most people can agree it's a bad thing. So why can't it be in Star Trek if apparently most people agree it's a bad thing? Like how is that woke? And the word woke has lost all meaning and it feels like it was only put in the title to get people to actually read the article and it worked because that's why I read the article. But when you read the substance, I guess it's a bit less sensationalist than it claims to be, but it's still acting like Star Trek has never covered partisan politics before. It's always about like broad topics, even like the interracial kiss stuff, which we're going to talk about a bit later. That is like a partisan issue. This is at a time in America where stuff like that was a partisan issue and there was a significant part of certain parties who were against things like this. But the Stacey Abrams thing did send a lot of these conservative types into a frenzy. So I just want to read a couple more articles from the National Review and The Spectator quick. And then from The Spectator, President Stacey Abrams gives Star Trek its far left final frontier. Star Trek Discovery embodies a transition from the franchise's traditional flirtation with left leaning politics to the over endorsement of the woke frontiers of left wing modernity. What sets Discovery apart is the obsessional focus on left-wing orthodoxy, LGBT relationships and related injustices, tick, anti-capitalism, tick. Discovery assumes that left-wing politics and race are mutually dependent. Abrams represents the pinnacle of his understanding. The modern left's moral certitude runs central to Abrams' casting and Discovery's identity. The show's executive producer, Michelle Paradise, told Deadline that there was no one better to be Earth's 32nd century president than Abrams. As someone who thinks it's pretty cringe Stacey Abrams was included in this Star Trek show, I just think it's a bit ridiculous to have a political figure play this fictional president of Earth, no matter how much the cast and crew might respect her. The criticisms they're making of this are just so ridiculous, especially the Spectator article about talking about how it's new that Star Trek has a bit of an anti-capitalist slant in it. Because people will tell you, big Star Trek fans, anti-capitalist sentiment is not something that just appeared in the shows in the 2020s. It has been in a lot of Star Trek properties and media. You could even argue like the world they inhabit, which is like post-scarcity, does have a lot more in common with like a communist utopia rather than some sort of like, you know, capitalist utopia. But it just shows they fundamentally do not understand science fiction or they've never really taken it in properly. And there's two like elements to this. Maybe like they don't remember everything in Star Trek or as you've seen in a lot of videos on my channel, conservatives' critical thinking skills are just really, really poor and they can't actually get the messages from science fiction. They just see the A to B plots and the universe, not thinking the universe is actually probably saying something broader about contemporary, I guess, earth politics and history and stuff like that. But I wanna go into like the creator of the show and his son talking about the show's politics and how it's always been like this place for like diversity and representation. Then I wanna go onto the interracial kiss and then some of its commentary on the Vietnam War and economics. So an article on Wired um, in 2013, Star Trek's history of progressive values and why it faltered on LGBT crew members. So in the future, Star Trek creator Roddenberry envisioned race and gender as non-issues. He put Japanese American George Takei as Lieutenant Hikaru Sulu at the helm, African American Nichelle Nichols as Lieutenant Niyota Uhura in the communications chair and even attempted to make the Enterprise's first officer a woman. Studio execs rejected this idea, so the alien Spock took the job. The equality on the USS Enterprise bridge was a watershed moment, both in television history and in Americans' understanding of social equality. Most television shows, at best, follow cultural trends. Star Trek had clear-cut ideals of its own, wrote Joan Winston, Jacqueline Lichtenberg, and Sondra Marshek in their 1975 book Star Trek Lives, the first and most definitive chronicle of the early years of the Trek fandom. No one would claim that Star Trek was the cause of all the improvement we've made with problems like racism and sexism, but it's still harder to believe that it had no effect when 20 million people tuned into Star Trek and saw Mr. Spock being treated as a friend and brother by Kirk, saw the black and the Russian and 
the Asian and the Southerner and the others treating each other with respect and love. Star Trek's inclusivity is the only thing that kept it alive. Eugene Rod Roddenberry, CEO of Roddenberry Entertainment and son of Star Trek's late creator, Gene Roddenberry, told Wired in 2010, it appealed to the people who were thinking differently, whether it was college students who were protesting the war or mixed race couples or just people with different ideas, the whole geek, nerd, dork fan movement was a bunch of people who looked at life differently. They're the ones leading the charge today. Though the show's philosophy no doubt encouraged white audiences' capacity for understanding and tolerance in the 60s and 70s, it was doing something vastly more concrete for the people of colour who were seeing faces like their own on television in uncaricatured roles for the first time. Cole's role as Uhura in particular was revolutionary. As most Americans first encounter with a nuanced, authoritative character played by an actor who was not only an African American but also a woman, her impact was even more extraordinary considering Nichols almost didn't return after the first season as she explained to the wall street journal in 2011 she decided to leave the show and return to broadway but a chance introduction at a fundraiser with martin luther king the self-proclaimed biggest trekkie on the planet made her reconsider he took my hand and thanked me for meeting him he then said i am your greatest fan all i remember is my mouth opening and shutting i thanked him so much and told him how i missed it all he asked what i was talking about and told me i couldn't leave the show you are changing the minds of people across the world because for the first time, through you, we can see ourselves and what we can be, he told her. In 1991, Roddenberry also told the press that he planned to add an LGBT character to the TNG cast that season, but when he died, suddenly a few months after the interview, his promises vaporized. So Rod Roddenberry also saying, but in the 23rd and 24th century, and preferably much sooner, whether you are straight, gay, black, white, male, female, it's a non-issue. You don't need to see someone walking around the Enterprise with a rainbow flag or any other stereotypical things that would announce that they're gay. I mean, there are interspecies relationships on Star Trek, so we're just beyond the point where being gay is an issue. So even like beyond the political issues that Star Trek often tackles, which we're going to get into a bit, what modern anti w say is woke is diversity. Diversity is woke inherently and it's left wing politically all these different things but there you can see from the history star trek was always woke by like the modern definition to these anti sws there's no way you could be complaining about woke politics in a woman being cast as a main character in something or a black person being cast or anything like that if you are an anti sw fan of star trek you're a massive hypocrite if you start complaining about woke politics because of the diversity of casting in any media property because Star Trek was one of the first to do this. Star Trek did have a really diverse cast because it did imagine this future where things like this did not even matter to the human race. So if you have a problem with wokeness, meaning diversity, then you should never like Star Trek in the first place, just based on the ethnic makeups of the original cast and the shows that followed. But now to talk about more woke things that Star Trek did, including obviously the very famous interracial kiss. 50 years ago, and only one year after the US Supreme Court declared interracial marriage legal, two of science fiction's most enduring characters, Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura, kissed each other on Star Trek. Kiss suggested that there was a future where these issues were not seen as a big deal. Eric Degens, national television critic for National Public Radio, the characters themselves were not freaking out because a black woman had kissed a white man. In this utopian-like future, we solve this issue, we're beyond it, and that was a wonderful message to send. Worried about the reaction from southern television stations, showrunners filmed the kiss between Shatner and Nichols, their lips are mostly obscured by the back of Nichols' head, and wanted to film a second where it happened off screen, but Nichols in her book said that her and Shatner deliberately flubbed lines to force the original take to be used. So obviously for some people in certain states in America, that was still a divisive issue but Star Trek never really shied away from commenting on contemporary politics and doing things that were in, I guess, the public discourse at the current time. So an article on history.com, how the original Star Trek addressed the war in Vietnam. The show's creator, Gene Roddenberry, says that setting the drama in space gave him the distance to address hot button cultural topics. It seemed to me that perhaps if I wanted to talk about religion, politics, make some comments against Vietnam and so on, that I had to make similar situations involving these subjects happening on other planets to little green people. Indeed, it might get by, and it did. In a private little war aired February 2nd, 1968, 
the Enterprise crew discovers that their Klingon enemies have been arming one tribe on a primitive planet with flintlock muskets. After Kirk gives muskets to the other tribe, claiming it will create a balance of power, Dr. McCoy objects. This excerpt from an episode transcript echoes the Cold War superpowers tensions that led to America's containment policy in Southeast Asia. The show's creators seem to undergo their own radical shift. Case in point, the Omega Glory, episode 23 in the series' second season, which is blatantly anti-war. To make his point, Roddenberry puts the Enterprise crew on a planet with two bitterly warring tribes, the Yangs and the Comms, with subtext about biological warfare and the immorality of outside interference. If those names weren't obvious enough, the Yangs or the Yanks have somehow in their history obtained an exact copy of the original US Constitution and revere it as a sacred text, although they don't understand it. In the climatic scene, Kirk holds up the Constitution before the chief of the victorious warring faction, declaring that the document and its principles of human rights were written for all people, even enemies. But while Kirk was touting Americans' ideological superiority, Franklin says declaring that communists or comms deserve the constitution's protection was a dangerous risk to take on television at that moment in history. So the original Star Trek wasn't like crazy anti-capitalist, like revolutionary communist or anything like that, but it was a show that was willing to be a commentary on current events. And the creator of the show even says that, like I could talk about politics through this show. I could criticize the Vietnam War, I could criticize certain things in politics, and it would get through the execs because I would disguise it as being like this unique new sci-fi show where people didn't really think about the messages too much. And obviously like those execs, I guess also shows the critical thinking is quite poor, that you can have a storyline like the one I read out to you about the Vietnam War, and they don't realize it's actually about the Vietnam War, despite the war being in its like most controversial year, 1968. The belief that Star Trek is suddenly woke, whatever that means, whether that means like covering contemporary politics or whether that means having a diverse cast is pretty laughable. And it just feels like conservatives who support the Republican Party are just pretty butthurt that like someone in the Democratic Party appeared on the show. So I just wanted to quickly talk about the economics of Star Trek and kind of like the Marxist influence on the world of Star Trek. So an article by Jason M. Barr. Now this article I don't think is very good overall, um, but I didn't mind its bit about like analysing the world of Star Trek's economics. So Smith, Marx and Picard, Star Trek and our economic future. So on the Marxist bit, so on the Marxist Star Trek bit, it says, despite the importance of the individual in the 24th century of Star Trek, there are many elements of Marxian economy that technology makes possible. With no material scarcity, there is no money and the greed it engenders simply melts away. And without money and greed, there could be no exploitation nor economic depressions. The lowliest worker has access to the Earth's bounty just as the greatest starship captain. Arguably, the obliteration of exploitation is given its highest expression by the Prime Directive, which prohibits members from Starfleet from interfering with the internal development or affairs of alien civilizations. It is at heart an anti-colonialism measure designed to stop a more technologically advanced civilization from the kind of oppression that Marx rallied against in the Communist Manifesto. Though Captain Kirk can simply steal dilithium crystals from the planet Hulken, he does not, for the Prime Directive teaches it is better to be fair than ruthless. Though the Prime Directive speaks to the moral equality across societies, this notion is also upheld with human society, especially with computing technology. Computers are tools to enhance the human experience. They provide resources, information, and allow for scientific research and discovery more broadly. Since there is no money and no greed, all technology is open source and available to all. Computers are strictly prohibited from being used for nefarious purposes. Arguably, one character who represents the ideal communist role is Mr. Spock. He repeatedly reminds Captain Kirk that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. His sole interest is in science and knowledge and doing what is good for society and his fellow shipmates. He continually sacrifices himself each time a crisis arises. So a post-scarcity world doesn't necessarily mean it's like, you know, communist utopia, but you guys who watch Star Trek and have followed the lore of the series probably do understand that a lot of these things are very, very compatible with a communist utopia. And in a lot of ways, Star Trek has very heavy elements of a communist utopia. And it is about the collective progress of mankind and people aren't exploited by these capitalist hierarchies and this capitalist system 
of economics. And I would say by the standards of anti HAW today, having this system in the Star Trek world is actually pretty woke, if woke even means anything these days. But you can see from what I've described, even if you're someone like me personally, who isn't like obsessive about Star Trek, hasn't watched it all like in order, like all the series, but just someone who's had like, you know, a reference point for it growing up. Like many of you probably have just watched multiple episodes out of order just because it's so popular. But when you actually delve into the subject matter, it's clear that Star Trek always started off as a progressive series and it's pretty left-leaning. Like I said, I wouldn't consider it the most radical criticism of contemporary politics or even in modern times like pushing diversity forward in like a really significant way, but it's clear back in the day, just having this diverse cast, this woke diverse cast, was actually very important for people to see all these different humans from different backgrounds all, I guess, collaborating for one goal. Sounds pretty woke and left-leaning to me. But I think a lot of right-wing people like in Star Trek speaks to a lot of different problems. Now, I think fundamentally, what happens is a lot of right-wing nerd types love these properties from a young age. So they love Star Trek as children. They love Star Wars as children. So when they get a bit older, they do not want to think of these properties they've loved for sometimes decades as actually having political messaging. Like when you go back and watch the prequels as an adult, it's highly political. Like you cannot ignore the politics in a trilogy that is all about politics. And it's clear where the influence is for the emperor and what he does come from. And George Lucas even said, the emperor is meant to be Richard Nixon. George Lucas said the rebels are meant to be the Viet Cong. But I think for a lot of these people, that becomes uncomfortable to their political identity, especially as people who do everything through the lens of politics in terms of if they will like it or not. These people do not like things they think have left-wing politics. So if you suddenly have to realize that, oh my God, the thing you love most in life is actually made by a pretty left-leaning director and has left-wing politics in it, it's probably gonna hurt your identity in some way so better to just ignore it. I've never really heard any of these anti hw types ever really talk about the politics of Star Wars. But Star Wars is not even the worst example of them liking something that goes against their politics and is probably woke in some way or another. And I think it speaks a lot to conservatives' critical thinking skills. And like Roddenberry was saying about his work and how he would set it in a sci-fi universe so he could talk about contemporary politics, I feel like as that tricked the executives to actually letting him do this, I think it tricks a lot of audiences as well, where they think, well, how can this sci-fi universe with weird aliens be saying anything about 2022 politics? They don't really understand how it could do that. So some people who have commented on my videos have like made fun of me for talking about Blade Runner and the environmentalism in Blade Runner in the sense that it shows you a future where the world has been destroyed by capitalism. That's like a big thing in both Blade Runner movies. It's not exactly the message of the film. It's not exactly central to the narrative of the film, but it's pretty clear both films are influenced by the years they were made. And it's pretty clear that Blade Runner 2049, the world is far bleaker in that film because the world of 2017, which it was made in, has a far bleaker outlook on the future than the 1980s did. I always say the difference between the two Blade Runner films is I'd want to go to the first Blade Runner world maybe for like a week and stay in a hotel or something just because I like love the rain and the neon. I would never want to go to the Blade Runner world of 2049 because they both reflect our outlooks at different times and we're very, very pessimistic of what this economic system is going to do to our world. That's why Blade Runner 2049 is sort of like a warning and being like, this is what the world's gonna look like if you don't change. The conservatives think, oh, it's sci-fi, it's just a story to like and a world to like, there is no message there. And I think it gets even worse when we go to the recent love for the new Dune movie. So I spoke about this a lot and I made a whole video specifically just talking about Dune and how conservatives completely missed the point. And I think the most ironic point of this is that not only do people like Jeremy from Geeks and Gamers say he absolutely loves Dune, I think the most funny one was Ben Shapiro saying it's like probably one of the best sci-fi movies of all time. This may be the best looking science fiction movie ever. And this movie is just spectacular looking. Like from beginning to end, every shot is a piece of art. The color scheme is wonderful. Every shot is beautifully constructed. The special effects are great. You see every dollar on the screen. The acting is 
excellent across the board. I think the movie is actually great. I think it's going to be hard to have sucks. But if this completes in the way that the first half is done, I think it's going to be one of the great sci-fi epics of all time. And I've always said, I have no problem with these guys liking films with left-wing messaging. I like right-wing films. And we actually spoke about this in my video, I think, last week, where a lot of you left in the comments what your favorite conservative film was. And I said Top Gun, the first one, was one of my favorite conservative films. But there are some good conservative films. But the problem with people like Ben Shapiro and Geeks and Gamers is they talk about woke everything. Like, Ben Shapiro said he didn't like the new Batman because it was, like, anti-white or something. I don't know how you can watch that film and read that message into it. So, as someone who is reading into something so much that he can think the Batman is anti-white, surely he wouldn't like Dune. And he wouldn't like Dune specifically because Dune has always been a massive criticism of colonialism and settler colonialism. Ben Shapiro is one of the biggest simps for Israel probably in Western politics, surely if he cares so much about woke politics, he would realize that the messages of the Dune book and the Dune film can be applied to him specifically and how he views Israel and how he views Palestine. Because it's pretty clear the Empire, the Atreides, everyone like that, they are the Israelis and the Fremen are like the Palestinians. Or they're like any other oppressed group in history. And of course, they were actually inspired by Islamic revolutionaries against colonial rule from the 1800s to the 1900s. Paul is referred to as the Mahdi. Who led the Sudanese revolution against the British and the Egyptians? A guy called the Mahdi. And it's obviously this version of Islam that believes the Mahdi to be this Islamic prophet. So the language there, very specific. There's many other Islamic words in Dune itself. And of course you have seen where Paul questions while they're growing like those palm trees in Arrakis because they're not native and they take so much water to grow. Just showing how like colonialists will exploit natural resources to just help themselves for stupid things rather than give it to the colonized population. Also that bit about how they could have made loads of water on Arrakis, but then they discovered that spice is very valuable. Spice can power their space travel. So why would they do that when they can just keep exploiting this world forever and keep exploiting the Fremen to make themselves more money? Again, very big critique of colonialism and capitalism. If you care about woke politics ruining everything, including the new Batman movie, Batman the movie about this wonderful billionaire who solves all Gotham's problems by beating up criminals, that's woke but there's nothing woke about the messaging in Dune. Again, conservatives' understanding of science fiction is really poor, and fundamentally, their critical thinking skills are so bad anyway. Even stories that aren't sci-fi that comment on these things, they often can't understand. But when it's sci-fi, it's just another level, where seemingly, because the movie doesn't literally say, this movie is about colonialism and is influenced by Islamic revolutions. This is what the movie is about. Unless it does something like that, they will never understand it's about that. And this applies to Star Trek too. Star Trek is only woke when Stacey Abrams is in it. Like, that's the woke part. Star Trek is only woke in 2022 with like a diverse cast or they talk about, I don't know, the Republican Party in some degree. But it was never woke before. It was never woke for having a diverse cast in 1960s, but apparently loads of things today are woke because they're diverse. So you love this thing that was doing the thing you hate 60 years ago. Again, please help me understand this. Anyway, that is it for the video. Please leave your thoughts down in the comments. Follow me on social media at The Cavernacle, on Twitter, on Instagram. Subscribe to the subreddit. Check out my Patreon. And if you made it this far, thank you for watching.